morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the people that are on the, the web as well. I'm James Overland. I'm a research oceanographer here at NOAA in Seattle Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory. And uh, the th theme I want to go over this morning is how, how do you interpret when you have a large extreme event that you've never seen before and it's not an easy question to to answer and goes back to enlightenment times and without any really uh, definitive answer on that so part of these working in the Arctic for the last 40 years, but then in the last 15 years, every year or two, we, we see what I call uh, surprises, unexpected large magnitudes of change. And probably the major one was in summer of 2007. Here, here's a map looking down at the north pole with Greenland here and the white is how much sea ice we had in summer of 2007 and that compares to this yellow to the yellow line which, which is the previous average value so there was was 40 percent less Arctic sea ice in that year compared to the average. And on, on the right hand side we have a plot of how much sea ice was in the Arctic uh, September every year. And uh, if I stand over here and just show the curve through 2007 we saw this enormous drop uh, one year drop in 2007. Uh, even even in midsummer 2007, we didn't really know that something like this was came, and so we were sitting sitting down here with a lot less sea ice and a whole lot more open water. And the question was, what's going to happen next? If you think all of these changes are are random, you might think, well, it's going to return more to the long-term downward change. But in <clears throat> in sea ice lore, when you have more open water rather than the sea ice, the white sea ice reflecting the sunlight, you absorb more sunlight into the upper ocean and so you're, you're adding a net amount of heat into the Arctic and the, the question was have we added enough heat in here that it's changed the whole system so once you started uh, adding more heat uh, then it would uh, that would be hard to get rid of, and, and we would uh, continue. Uh, whatever causes to start uh, to happen after you had this minimum amount of heat here, when you have a runaway loss, and that's what they call a tipping point. That for however you got down here, you had different physics related to adding more heat. Well, in, in fact, what happened, we did go back uh, to the long-term uh, uh, long trend down. So we didn't really have a tipping point in this case. And in fact, this would be called regressing back to the mean when you have a real outlier you know, the standard story is, well, it, it will return more to uh, the long-term average. 
Another example happened a couple of years later. All the all the snow on uh, Greenland all melted out at once. Once one July hadn't happened before, and uh, during during the early part of the decade here, we had several years in a row where Greenland ice melted a lot faster than it had been melting. But in the last few years, uh, it, it slowed down com compared to those rapid rates. So again, it's a question of a uh, real extreme we never saw before, but a general uh, change back to the long-term rate. So, so those are types of surprises, but in this we have a real long-term change in what uh, what's happening with uh, sea ice. And again, we're looking at at maps and through models and satellite data, people were a able to calculate how old different pieces of regions of ice was. And back in the 80s, you had a lot of uh, old thick ice that was uh, moving around in the Arctic more than seven years. So it was three or four meters thick. Uh, and most of the Arctic was made up of this really old thick uh, sea ice. And why, why that was important for, is for the climate, that was a real big flywheel. It doesn't matter what the winds are doing, all that, this big, enormous chunk of ice uh, was pretty stable, didn't vary a whole lot from year to year. But then uh, what we've seen, especially in the last 15 years, is most of that old sea ice has melted out or mo moved out into the Atlantic and melted. And now most of the, the ice is uh, just a year or two old. So rather than this big climate flywheel, we now have thinner ice that will move around faster and respond uh, quicker to changes in winds and temperatures. So another way of uh, measuring that a friend of mine works on from from satellites, you can get a direct measure of that. That ice that that froze in in a certain fall is called first year ice, and it has more salt in it than than ice that's been around for multiple years and the satellites can tell the difference. So they can't tell the ultimate age of the ice, but they can tell whether it was uh, first year ice or older than first year ice. So in so these show the map for every January uh, starting in uh, uh, the year 2000 and the reg are the amount of this old thick multi-year ice and this is for January so the blue is not open water it's actually this thin uh, first year ice so uh, back before 2007 we had mostly multi-year ice and then in the winter after that 2000 seven loss, uh, most of that 40% open water froze and became first year ice. So when we were down here in, in, uh, in winter 2008 after 2007 summer, we had mostly first year ice and a little bit of multi-year ice. And then in the following Years after that, 
uh, the first ear ice will be stuck around and it's going to have second and third ear ice. And so uh, the actual amount of multi-year goes up because we, we don't have seven or eight year old ice, but we have two or three year old ice. And then again, after 2012, we had a real drop in the multi-year, but then we, we came back with two and third year sea ice. And then this year, we had another major drop. And so overall, we've, we've lost 60% of that old thick multi-year ice compared to uh, 20, 20 years ago. And we've lost the climate flywheel from the Arctic. Oh. So, so one thing that can happen is 2007, 2012, we had an extreme, but we went back to the long-term average. And that's the general case for meteorologists. If we have an outlier case, it'll probably turn back more to average values. So that's certainly one thing that can happen. Another thing that can happen is we can pass certain thresholds north of Bering Strait. In the old days, walrus would, in the summer, would drift around on individual ice flows. But uh, in the last decade, we've had more and more cases where there's no sea ice north of Bering, Bering Strait, and they've had to come out on land, and, and as long as we continue with global warming, you know, this is going to be primarily the case. A third thing is we have some irreversibility uh, going on. Permafrost is made up of frozen soil and ice, and if you melt that permafrost, the the ice part runs away as water, and there's no way you can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Now, ice, that uh, water part is gone, and so, uh, you know, the, the permafrost that had been there for tens of thousands of years uh, is irreversibly lost. The other thing that happened is with less sea ice and more open water, you can have more waves. So we're getting more erosion on the north coast of Alaska, and that's an irreversible process, at least on decadal times of scales. So that's all the introduction. What I want to get to is what we've seen in terms of our temperatures in the last year. And so this is a temperature map. We're looking down at the North Pole. Here's Alaska. Here's uh, Greenland. And we can contour areas that are all the same temperature. And so in the center part of the Arctic near the North Pole and around there, we have six degree average temperatures from average over January uh, through March last winter. And this is nearly double the previous record for our temperatures. So we're not, we're not talking some initially of some process, well, we, we've just increased a little bit compared to where we were before, and it's the same process is going on. The first thing you think about is, wow, this is really out there. Is something special, special going on? And we look, we look into it, and as I'll show later, there was a change in the winds around the outside of the Arctic that brought warm air in. So it wasn't a internal process in the center of the 
are like reflection and radiation. It was primarily this outside source. So we say, well, this is this is a real outlier, but it was caused by some random weather events. We'll never see it again. Well, this last fall, here's the same extreme temperatures going on, and they had roughly the same cause from changing the winds coming into the Arctic. So now we have two examples of real outliers. So, um, you know, are, is it random or has, have things changed? Certainly, from a meteorological point of view, you have two years that that look identical. But you know, the the fact that we have such large numbers is still something to really uh, uh, try and assimilate. And not only do we have the warm temperatures, but you know, I showed you the minimum sea ice in, in summer months, and we've had records on that. Uh, the red bars show that every month during the year had less than average sea ice area around. Uh, and not only that, but if you look, what was the rank where most of the winter and spring and again in the fall, this last year had the minimum amount of sea ice for that particular month compared to all history. So there's a lot going on on the sea ice that's tied in with the uh, temperature increases. So you have to bear with me a little bit of geeky meteorology that we also want to look at the wind patterns. And meteorologists tend to look at the differences in pressure that cause the winds. And so if, if we're at the surface, you can look at a level surface or sea level, and you look at differences in pressure, and they uh, they cause the uh, cause the winds, but if you go up in the atmosphere, rather than looking at differences in pressure on a constant level surface, you turn that back around and you pick a constant pressure surface, and then you look at at how high that is and how it slopes, and so those are the types of weather maps that that meteorologists look at. And uh, so th this is a map of the heights of one of those pressure surfaces where in regions where it's warm, air is less dense. And so uh, a constant pressure level, the distance between the high, its high and the ground will be higher in, in warmer areas generally in lower and lower areas. So around mid latitudes, you know, you have higher heights, yet the Arctic is colder, you tend to have lower heights. And so the difference between those two regions causes the 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 steepness of the difference to be strong and that's uh, so the the winds follow the the lines of constant height, and if the lines are bunched, you have uh, stronger winds. And also notice that, that there's some irregularities here, that it's not just a uniform blob of cold temperatures. So the, the other thing about this jet stream or lower atmosphere polar vortex is it, it can change from a real tight pattern with one cold spot to more of a wavy pattern where the flow is unstable or chaotic on a rotating earth and so you have a more wavy pattern. So 
uh, in the, the strong pattern, the jet stream is across northern Canada and in winter, but uh, uh, if you have the wavy pattern, it can reach further down into the U.S. and further down into Eastern Asia. So one of the things we're looking at is the difference between <coughs> the more uniform pattern and the wavy pattern, and part of the reason for the warm Arctic is that the last two years we've been more in a wavy pattern. So now, so now for your your final on this is here here's this height pattern for last winter. And so the winds follow the light, the, the constant colors. And if you look at the light purple, we see, you see two separate pieces of the polar vortex that it's split into two pieces. And so if you follow the light purple, the winds are coming up over Alaska into the Arctic, and they're flowing from around Iceland and all the way towards the North Pole, and they're bringing warm, warm, wa warm air with them. And so this last fall, if we look at the average from October to December, we have a very similar split vortex with uh, not quite as wavy a pattern over uh, North America. So the other thing that was going on this fall, as I noted before, was there was record minimum sea ice. And so if we look at the sea ice map for November, the, the purple is where it used to be, and uh, the white is where it was now. So north of Norway here, we have a whole lot of open water and north of Alaska, we have a whole lot of open water compared to where it used to be. And so what, what's happening is that this warm air is coming in from the south, and two things are happening. One is that it, the warm air is helping the ice or keeping the ice from uh, growing in the fall. This should be all ice covered by November, but it's really retarding the growth of the ice as you're bringing warm, warm air into both of these regions, and also the winds are holding the ice back. But once you started having the, these regions of op open water rather than than ice, the warm the warm air is flowing over a warmer surface, and so the air can get further into the Arctic and, and reach uh, the North Pole and places like that. So, so we have this new feedback that the warm air coming from the south is... Uh, holding back the ice formation in the fall. That's allowing the air to go further. And then the warmer air is less dense, and so it can change the height field and continue that split uh, polar vortex longer than it might other, otherwise happen. So uh, people have... So, well, we should have this kind of feedback. They've been saying it for 15 years or so, but I think this last, well, this last fall is a very clear case uh, that uh, that feedback between the ice, the weather, and the winds uh, has kicked in. Now, another question that comes up is, uh, do all these changes in the Arctic, do they affect the weather down where we live? And it's a real controversial uh, question and part of what we're working on. And, and uh, one of the 
uh, uh, issues might be, you know, how can global warming in a warm Arctic uh, affect cold temperatures down over the U.S.? And uh, it's a complex uh, issue. So one of the things we've done is on the left picture here that when the eastern U.S. is really cold, oftentimes the western U.S. and the ocean off of the west coast is warmer. So warmer air has higher heights. So you tend to, if you map the jet stream, you tend to have this more wavy part where the winds are coming up over Alaska, bringing warm air on the east side of the high pressure, uh, which is called a ridge. You're bringing cold air from the Arctic down into the central U.S., and that eventually moves uh, over the east coast. And this, this, this is a long-term pattern. There's nothing real Arctic related to uh, this type of pattern. But, but now, uh, with no ice north of Alaska, things are a little different. That, that normally, this, the northern end of this uh, ridge feature goes over Alaska, but uh, now we have an ice-free area that's warmer over north of Alaska, and that can help lock in more of that wavy pattern. And the northern extent of uh, the higher heights or pressure will reach well into the central Arctic in early December. And so you had a lot more, uh, a lot higher latitude for the start of bringing cold air down. So th this might be one first real example where the Arctic did play a role in the weather on the East Coast. And there were, during early December, there were record cold temperatures on the, on the East Coast. So, so where are we now? The, we, had, we had a really warm winter last year, and then we started off with a warm fall this winter. Well, this winter is progressing just like last winter as well. And here's the map for January of uh, the warmer temperatures, and you can see that there are warm colors uh, throughout throughout the Arctic, and uh, and on the right here is is a map that shows how much ice there is in the Arctic in every month for every year, and the blue line represents uh, the amount of ice that's in the Arctic every fall month this year, and you can see that the blue line is below every other year. So we're continuing uh, less ice this year than ever before. One of the differences is uh, while the, the waviness of the jet stream is really strong over the Atlantic side, it's a little more variable on the U.S. side. So we've been having cold and warm uh, events uh, throughout this winter. So it hasn't been all, all cold. So in summary, summary up, the Arctic is certainly moving to in the un uncharted territory. Not only do we have extreme temperatures, but we just about doubled the previous previous ones. And we're pretty much out of old thick ice. So the ice is variable uh, in speed and it's thinner. So there can be a lot more interaction between the ice, the ocean, uh, 
in the weather. So these these are places we've never been before, and and so what's next? How do we look? How do we look at that? And if you just look at sort of one one process at a time, you say, well, the, according to statistics, uh, you know, when you have an extreme that that uh, future cases will will rather than stay out there will return uh, more towards uh, uh, the long-term conditions. And sea ice tends, has tended to do that 2007, 2012. Uh, and when they run models, you can't really make the models uh, have a tip of tipping point and explode to completely go away. You, you need the, the general long-term increase in global warming to keep that going. So that, that's a possibility. And, and if you think in terms of, of the wavy or not wavy jet stream, the last two winters had the wavy jet stream. And uh, these are all the change between these patterns is rather random. So you know, pretty soon we've got to eventually end up with a year with more of of the straight wind pattern, which would would knock out the uh, the really warm Arctic. It's not something happening in the Arctic that's that's the main cause of the warm temperature. It, it's the new connection uh, between the Arctic and the mid-latitude winds. On the, on the other hand, in, we have two years where we've had the warm Arctic, that when we have the wavy pattern, we've ended up with a new extreme temperatures. So we expect the wavy pattern and the non-wavy pattern to oscillate back or back and forth in different years. But it sure looks like when we have the wavy pattern with uh, the wave with the wavy pattern with the winds the warm coming to the south and retarding the ice and then the open water allowing the temperatures to increase. We certainly have two good examples of that. So we have additional information now that perhaps every time we get a wavy pattern we're going to be more likely to have the warm uh, the warm temperatures. So uh, that's an example of Bayesian statistics where we have a certain condition and then we have new information and we need to look at the new information rather than just saying, oh, it's, it's, all, it's all random. So in summary, the art is not only changed, but in the last year it's really taken a quantum leap to Places that had never been before by a lot, a lot, uh, a lot different. And part of the speculation then is, well, thing, things tend to be random. We we do think that there's a new example of the feedback between uh, the weather, the winds, the temperatures, and the loss of sea ice. So thank you very much, and we can take some questions. Chris. Thanks. That was a wonderful talk, Jim. Thanks. Um, so what happened last September? It seemed like we were on track to be exceptionally low ice, and then all of a sudden you 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 broke it like in your rankings. You went from one, 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 all the way up to five, and then now you're back down to ones again. What happened there? Yeah, that uh, good, 
Big question. So whether you have low sea ice in September depends on two things. One is the amount of ice you start with, and we started with a lot less ice in May. So we say, well, if you just have average conditions for the winds and the weather during the summer, you're probably going to have an extreme. Or rather than then the high pressure that we've seen for the last five years in the summer are we went back to the kind of weather patterns that we used to 20 years ago in the Arctic summer where we had more low pressure and storms. So, uh, so the, the weather itself during the summer was not conducive to a low sea ice in September. And when you added the two together, that's why we, we hit the third or fourth minimum case. It was, it was a minimum case based on a starting condition, but it was countered by the weather in the summer. Uh, so you mentioned um, what is indeed a controversial topic about the potential for feedbacks of the open water on the circulation itself, and yeah. as you say, you know how um, uh, wavy the pattern is. And of course, there's lots of ways for the atmosphere to have those kinds of um, uh, right. you know, uh, circulation. Are people? Um, what are they doing in terms of kind of? dynamically linking, uh, trying to link the loss of sea ice to uh, more likely um, asymmetric uh, patterns like that. And in particular, is anybody doing things where they take the actual con atmospheric conditions and like imposing sea ice and seeing if it's different? Yeah, uh, important but different. Uh, difficult question. Two weeks ago I was at a workshop on that very question and there were a hundred people that showed up. So uh, because, because it impacts where people live, there's a lot of interest in that. The, the problem is that you can come up with ideas for how the loss of ice has warmer temperatures and increases these uh, height pressure fields uh, and impact, but there's a whole lot of chaos going on and different processes both in the Arctic and then when you get down to mid latitudes, you know, we have the tropics and we have the blob warm temperatures in the North Pacific and, and the Arctic all potentially feeding into that. So people are looking at it as an important problem, but it's an extremely difficult problem to tease out because there's so much chaos going on in the, the, in the actual atmosphere and there are a lot of model studies to try and do what you say. They, they take out the ice and run the cases again. And different models give different answers. And the same model, if you run it over and over, give different answers as well due to the, just the background chaos. So where the field is, is we, we don't think the whole East Coast is going to move to colder winters. You can't say the climatology is really a fact, but you can find case studies such as here, and you can find case studies for Eastern Asia where you can show uh, the linkage from the sea ice through three or four different processes ending up with cold temperatures. Jim, you showed that um, six degree uh, warm temperature anomaly from uh, global rain analysis. Right. Are there any in situ observations or satellite observations that can give back up that uh, that results give you a sim similar amplitude of uh, warm temperature? 
when when we pub when we published this, that was the the main question we got. And so there there are now four different reanalyses, as you know, out there. So we compared the different reanalyses that reanalyses take the individual observations and try and make fields of them, but they do it in slightly different ways. And and so there was about a one degree difference between the reanalyses there. But you can also go back and look at individual stations in, in northern Scandinavia and northern Canada and Barrow, Alaska, that map real well on onto those. Or so those observations are in the reanalyses uh, as well. So we're pretty confident that those overall patterns and the magnitudes are real, certain, certainly within a degree or two. And that and and that puts them way out of the bounds from what we've seen before. Um, so, so you showed a map of November ice cover, and there's a big open water in the Jin Sea, Greenland Sea, Norwegian Sea, Iceland Sea yeah. that area. So, being an oceanographer, I, I keep wondering: Do you think the ocean oceanic heat transport into that region might also play a role between besides the the atmos atmospheric forcing? That's one question. The other question is: You show this satellite. Uh, ice thickness time series in the past 20 right, years. Right, right. If you look at uh, the, the, the thick ice, there actually seems to my eye there is a regime shift after 2007. In other words, in sea ice thickness, there might actually be a tipping point um, comparing to ice extent, which tends to fluctuate a lot. So I wonder if you have any... No, I, I, think, I think that's a good point. I mean, if you look at the the curve from all the years, we never, you know, we we sl we recover slightly because we're getting some two and three year old ice after we had mostly first year ice. So, but but that's not a real recovery back to where it was with seven or eight year old ice. So, so I, uh, uh, you know, we don't. Uh, that's a really important point is we don't necessarily see it in the ice extent, but uh, we may see the, a bit of a tipping point in the ice in the ice thickness. The, the, uh, the other point that you're bringing is you know the, the variability of the inflow of warm water in the ocean helps keep that ice back. Uh, in north of Norway, and that that varies, and so that that helped the case here. But but the real why did it happen? You know, quickly in one year had to do with bringing the warm air, and not only the warm air, but the moist. The air was moister, and and that uh, that radiates more radiation energy and, and keeps keeps that there. So there's some effect there, but I think the bigger one is we've had some warm temperatures off the northeast coast of uh, North America. And so uh, one of the questions is, is how do the sea surface temperatures also help set up the long wave pattern. And there's a lot of chaos in those patterns, but uh, if, if the way I like to think about it, if you have the warm sea temperatures or different sea ice, you're, it's like rolling loaded dice that you'll have more of a tendency for the wavier pattern. And people think that the North Atlantic temperatures help, help set this uh, uh, flow flow into the Arctic, and that was due to you know what you have this wavier pattern, but the wavier pattern can move west to east, and that affects locally what's going on. So uh, you can't ignore the oceanography in the North 
uh, North Atlantic or the North Pacific. So, Jim, I always look forward to your talks on the Arctic. I never look forward to the message you bring, though. Uh, <laughs> not your fault. Uh, split polar vortices. Uh, presumably, you can look back through uh, real analyses in the past, uh, reanalyses in the past, and look at those. Do they happen? Have they happened in the past? And are these more extreme than what we've seen in the past? That sort of question. Um, in fact, they're are, they are fairly common feature in winter it's just that this one was stronger stronger than that and uh, when you go when you go back looking about these warm uh, intrusions of warm air into the Arctic they happen every decade or two decades or so uh, so in fact, I, I was looking over the whole winter, but there are several papers that, that talked about, you know, not, not only over time is that warm air coming in, but it's coming in in a couple of really strong storms. You see in the paper that, the, uh, in fact, last week, that the North Pole is above freezing in the first week in February. You know, and and so those have been seen in the past, but uh, not as clearly uh, clearly as this. And the magnet the magnitudes of of uh, the temperatures have never been seen. Yeah. Jim, what's happening to the um Glaciers, like in Baffin Island, and are they breaking off ice islands, or is there? I, I guess I'm wondering what's happening to those chunks of ice that are coming off the land. Um, and the other thing is, are they going to be a hazard for habitation? <laughs> uh, good question. I don't know for sure off of. Baffin Island, there, there's a long-term downward trend in loss of glaciers throughout North America, and those re regions are uh, uh, certainly involved. So, uh, you know, the, we have cruise ships going through the Northwest Passage, and there's a lot of channels between the islands north of there, and so it's fairly dangerous if you have some ice up in those islands, even though it looks like the Northwest Passage is clear. You have some bigger icebergs drifting down uh, in there. And, uh, and I am partly finishing up on Nick's, Nick's point. Uh, be afraid. <laughs> The, I mean, part of the story is we keep having these surprises, and those don't really show up well in the computer climate models, uh, and the computer models end up being slower. Mu Yin and I work at looking at these these. Uh, climate models and, and we've written up, well, the Arctic's going to be four degrees warmer by 2040. Well, we've had two years where already in, where the real world is saying we have a winter that's uh, uh, on average uh, already four degrees. So presumably it's going to going to go back, but it's these interactions that I'm talking about between the weather, the winds, the temperature, and the sea ice. They're not really involved very much in these models and are showing that they can really amplify where, where we are. So, um, you know, we're, we're less solid about what's the 30 or 40 year prediction because uh, we have these interactions. On the other hand, the modelers that do sea ice, you know, are really looking at that, that steady downward uh, 
trend and saying, well, maybe things aren't as bad as they they might be. But I think it's these surprises that make me really nervous about about that. And if we if we're able to slow down the emissions and, and limit the global temperatures to two degree warming, the Arctic is still going to be four or five degree warming by mid-century. And so that's completely going to change the whole Arctic. What, what you can do economically, what animals are there, how the ecosystem is structured. So even if we're uh, somewhat stabilized and, and can live with a two degree warming here, the art the art is going to be way out of of uh, what we've ever known in the Arctic. So that's the bad news. The good news is, hey, there's lots of cool data to look at. permafrost with, uh, you know, Greenland snow cap and, of course, the glaciers and everything. Is freshwater input or is that you know, new freshwater circulation patterns a factor at all in, in setting a new baseline for oceanic currents or sea surface temperatures and whatnot, either locally or regionally? Uh, yes. And I'm, in, I'm involved with, with some uh, global assessments of the Arctic and one of the main chapters is on freshwater, and uh, we're, uh, that the whole freshwater cycle, uh, the rain runoff, freshwater in the oceans is all increasing and speeding up, and the the uh, the models are projecting that the Arctic should be have more net. Uh, rainfall than it used to, simply because you're bringing more more moisture into the Arctic. So, yeah, that that's that's a part of it. Okay, thank you very much.